Hi everybody and welcome back. Uh, this video is part of what will be a series of videos on uh, neuromuscular physiology and pharmacology. And the goal of this video is to provide you with a sort of bird's eye view or an overview of how neuromuscular transmission works. In later videos, we're going to dive into detail into all of the different steps of how this takes place. But I thought it'd be helpful just at the beginning to give you uh, sort of an overview of the process. So I'll start by um, bringing up some annotations and I'll orientate you to this diagram here. You can see the motor neuron at the top, then we have the muscle membrane, which you see all, there's all these folds in, which we'll talk about in a second. And then there's the gap between the two, that, which we call the junctional cleft, or some, sometimes called the synaptic cleft. So that's just sort of an orientation to what these structures are. And then I'm going to sort of take you through how the nerve transmission comes down the motor neuron and uh, how that leads to muscle contraction. So we see in the next couple of annotations here, the motor neuron is originally myelinated all the way down its axon until it reaches its terminal here, and then it loses its myelin. It actually becomes sort of wrapped in Schwann cells at this level, which I don't have drawn. You can see some of the structures of the of the nerve terminal. There's mitochondria here, which are important in energy production. Those also help in uh, the production of acetylcholine, which is the uh, neurotransmitter that's important for neuromuscular junction physiology. And then there's microtubules, which are sort of supporting structures of the, of the end of the nerve terminal. Next, we'll uh, talk about a couple of other structures here. You can see that there are these blue little circles, these are vesicles, and these are really key to this process. These contain acetylcholine, um, the molecule acetylcholine, and there's lots and lots of acetylcholine packaged into, into these vesicles, and again, we'll talk more about these in future videos. Um, and that's how they're stored, ready for to be released into the junctional cleft. The nerve terminal will make acetylcholine, and we'll talk about that as well later. But it's produced in the nerve terminal, and then it's packaged into these little blue vesicles here. And those vesicles will congregate um, to, at the end of the nerve here, towards the nerve membrane, in these areas called active zones. And I have those in the sort of thick orange bar, are those active zones. So these vesicles, packed with acetylcholine, congregate at the end of the nerve terminal next to the active zones. You also see that Conveniently, and by no accident, placed very close to the active zones are these voltage-gated calcium channels. When the nerve impulse here travels down the motor neuron, like this, this is all depolarizing as the nerve fires. I'm not going to get into how action potentials and depolarization of nerves work. There's tons of tons of videos on the internet that you can have a look for those. But this nerve is depolarizing. It's coming down here. There's membrane changes as the nerve depolarizes all the way down to the bottom. When it reaches these calcium channels, these calcium channels respond to changes in membrane voltage. So they're voltage-gated calcium channels. And what happens is when this depolarization from the nerve reaches these calcium channels, there is a huge influx of calcium into the end of the nerve terminal. All right? And that calcium is actually super important. What that does is the calcium then is going to bind to these vesicles and it promotes them to start to migrate completely to the membrane here. And when these vesicles migrate to the membrane of these active zones, they eventually fuse with the membrane in this uh, process of exocytosis, which we'll get into later on, and they spit out all of this acetylcholine. So you can imagine with all of these vesicles that are packed with acetylcholine, start to migrate towards the end of the nerve terminal when the calcium enters, and it spits all the acetylcholine out into the junctional cleft. So then you're going to have a junctional cleft that is absolutely flooded with acetylcholine. So let's look at the other side of the of the neuromuscular junction now and look at some of the structures over there. Uh, what's great? So you can see that the muscle membrane here that we talked about earlier, and then there's these big deep folds uh, in the muscle membrane. These kind of invaginations in the membrane, and these are called clefts. And there's two types, as you can see depicted here. The kind of primary clefts are like these initial big folds, and then secondary clefts are sort of folds within the primary clefts. Um, so that's how they, so the nomenclature of those. 
And then uh, you can see that at the sort of bottom of these uh, secondary clefts, we have these voltage-gated sodium channels. And those are gonna come in uh, important in terms of how the depolarization of this muscle membrane is propagated down the membrane. And we'll chat about that in a second. Um, you also see on this side, these green sort of blobs here, and those are the acetylcholine receptors. So these are obviously a super key part of this process. Um, these are the receptors that acetylcholine will bind to, to cause the membrane to depolarize uh, and subsequently muscle contraction to happen. So these are nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, and these are these ones in green. And they are clustered at the sort of crests of these, um, these sec the primary clefts. And they're clustered in a way that they sort of line up with the uh, active zones of the, of the prejunctional membrane of the nerve terminal. So that when the acetylcholine is released, it's already sort of pointing and directed at the, at the receptors. And interestingly enough, there's, there's these um, sort of protein filaments called basal lamina, which uh, I haven't drawn here, but they, you can imagine them kind of connecting, uh, connecting in these things here. And their job is to sort of keep the nerve and the, and the uh, muscle membrane kind of connected just at the right spot. So all of this happens and lines up well. All right, so the calcium enters the end of the nerve terminal, as we mentioned. That is in response to the depolarization of this motor nerve, voltage-gated calcium channel, calcium floods into the end of the nerve terminal. The calcium then interacts with these vesicles. The vesicles start to migrate towards the end of the nerve terminal, to in, uh, where these active zones are, and they sort of spill out all of this acetylcholine into the cleft. The acetylcholine then travels across the cleft, and maybe I'll just zoom in here quickly. So these acetylcholine molecules are gonna travel across the junctional cleft and interact with the, um, with the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And we're gonna get into that in much more detail in subsequent videos, but ultimately there's a, there's a sort of a receptor here and two acetylcholine molecules need to bind to the receptor um, for it to activate the receptor. And when that happens, the receptor sort of changes shape uh, and that change of shape opens a pore uh, in the center of the receptor, which allows sodium to rush in to the muscle membrane. All right, so the acetylcholine molecules bind to the acetylcholine receptors. Uh, two molecules and one receptor causes the receptor to open and sodium floods into, into, the, um, into the muscle membrane. And what that does is that's gonna change the, uh, the charge of the muscle membrane in terms of the inside of the cell uh, in relation to the outside of the cell. The inside of the cell is all of a sudden gonna become much, much more positive when all this sodium rushes in. And that's where the sodium channels, uh, voltage-gated sodium channels come in that we mentioned earlier. So we'll zoom back out to those. So you see these voltage-gated sodium channels down here. They will then respond to this change in charge of the membrane that happens when all the sodium rushes in. All right, and when, that, when they uh, get triggered by the voltage change of the membrane, they open as well, and then sodium rushes through these as well. All right, and that's important because the depolarization of the rest of the muscle cell outside of this neuromuscular junction is dependent on these voltage-gated sodium channels. The acetylcholine receptors are really only present in this neuromuscular junction area. So if I zoom out a little bit more, and you can see over here that there's there's sort of the rest of the muscle membrane over here. That the area where that isn't directly connected to a nerve doesn't really have a lot of these acetylcholine receptors under normal circumstances. It's these sodium channels that that uh, propagate the reaction. So when these sodium channels here, let's say this guy, when he senses the change in um, the change in charge of the muscle membrane from the sodium channels opening, these guys are gonna open as well, sorry about that. These guys are gonna open as well, and sodium's gonna rush down these uh, into, the, into the muscle cell. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna create this sort of wave of depolarization that will travel all the way down the muscle cell and ultimately lead to muscle contraction. Let's talk about acetylcholinesterase now. I'm just gonna zoom in here so we can see this better. The acetylcholine binds to the nicotinic receptors, causes a muscle depolarization. We need some way for that to be sort of undone. Uh, 
we need this process to be repeatable um, so that multiple muscle contractions can take place. If there was nothing to counteract the acetylcholine, then there's nothing to stop them just continually binding to these receptors, constantly causing depolarization, and then we would never have multiple muscle contractions. We'd never be able to reset this whole neuromuscular junction process and start all over again. So we need some way to kind of bring things back to, to, to the baseline or back to the original settings, as it were. And that's where acetylcholinesterase comes in. So acetylcholinesterase is simply the enzyme that destroys acetylcholine. It is produced in the muscle membrane. So if I can sort of scribble on here, it'll be produced in the muscle membrane and then it's released from the muscle membrane into the junctional cleft. The acetylcholinesterase is released into the cleft in kind of an interesting way. Uh, it actually remains attached to the muscle membrane. There are these little stalks of collagen that are described that keep the acetylcholinesterase molecules sort of in the proximity of the receptors and of the muscle membrane. Because you can imagine if this was just sort of released into the junctional cleft, it may diffuse away into the rest of the interstitial fluid and not stay concentrated in the neuromuscular junction where it needs to be. So these acetylcholinesterase molecules with their sort of collagen stalks attaching them to the um, muscle membrane, at least to me, create this visual of a sort of minefield of um, acetylcholinesterase molecules that the acetylcholine has to sort of navigate its way through to make it to the receptors. So again, briefly, the acetylcholine is released in huge numbers into the junctional cleft. It then has to make its way across and bind to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. It's either going to make it there and bind to the receptor, or it's going to get destroyed by the acetylcholinesterase on the way. Luckily, huge amounts of acetylcholine is released into the cleft for every nerve depolarization. So there's plenty, under normal circumstances, plenty of acetylcholine to interact with the nicotinic receptors and cause uh, muscle depolarization. The acetylcholine molecules that do make it across and bind to the nicotinic receptors, we talked about how they two molecules bind to one receptor. They only bind for a very, very short period of time, a fraction of a second, and then they unbind and when they unbind, they're now just free in the junctional cleft and they invariably get destroyed by the, um, by the acetylcholinesterase. Once the nicotinic receptors have been bound to by two acetylcholine molecules, they open, the central pore allows sodium to rush through into the muscle membrane. That changes the voltage of the muscle membrane, which is sensed by the voltage-gated sodium channels. They sort of take it from there and carry this wave of depolarization down the muscle membrane, which ultimately leads to muscle contraction. So I think I'm gonna leave it there for this first video. That's quite a lot to uh, process in one go. Um, so feel free to watch this a few times and get the hang of it. And then in subsequent videos, we'll go into a bit more depth. Thanks for watching.